Hi folks, this is Jason of Samuel Sweemer Theological Seminary. It's good to see you. And uh, we're just going to share a few thoughts about the Reformers Wingley and uh, just share a few little uh, facts about his life. And uh, maybe you might go into studying studying him a bit more. Uh, Zwingli, um, here are some quotes by Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, he says, Therefore those who hear are God's sheep, are the church of God, and cannot err. For they follow the word only of God, which can in no wise deceive. But if they follow another word, they are not Christ's sheep, nor flock, nor church. For they follow a stranger, for it is characteristic of the sheep, not even to hear a stranger. And a prayer by Ulrich Zwingli, the Swiss reformer. Almighty God, eternal and compassionate, whose word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open and enlighten our hearts, that we may understand purely and clearly thy words. May they transform us according to this exact understanding, that we may never be displeasing to thy divine majesty through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's uh, a few little quotes by the great uh, Swiss reformer. So Inglia was born on the 1st of January 1884 and he died on October and um, the 11th of October 1531. He trained in uh, the University of Vienna and at the University of Basel and was quite uh, a scholar and uh, was trained in humanistic humanist uh, thinking of the time. Um, he became a, a pastor in Zurich and he had his first controversy in 1522 which was uh, about fasting in Lent. Um, just a, that, that first controversy he cooked some sausages uh, and uh, it was against the Catholic uh, hierarchy who ordered that uh, coming Lent we should fast and uh, he was um, Zwingli was sort of making the point that this is kind of we're under law and not grace by making making us uh, do these kind of things so he cooked some sausages um, when everyone else was fasting and it it drove the hierarchy of the time crazy um, Zwingli began to start reforms and they were in three areas one was he believed that um, the priest, uh, the clergy should marry, which was quite revolutionary. He vigorously attacked the use of images in churches and he also attacked the corruption within the church. So these are the three areas that he began to um, agitate on uh, politically and religiously. Then um, Luther got wind of Zwingli and wanted to know get to know this uh, Swiss reformer so they met at Marburg uh, and they just didn't agree on the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper um, Luther was saying that it literally had the mystical presence of Christ when they took the bread and the wine and Zwingli was saying no it was just symbolic and so they didn't get on uh, at that uh, meeting it was on the 1st of July 1519 He'd already pastored and done uh, ministry, but on the 1st of July, 1519, it was his first sermon in Zurich, Zwingli's first sermon. Also that year, 1519, uh, there, in August, there was um, a, um, a plague, and um, many, many people left, left the city. They just left Zurich. But um, he stayed and continued, Zwingli stayed and continued to, to do his pastoral duties and look after the people. Charles V um, was trying to work out uh, a compromise between the Catholics and um, the reformers um, round about uh, near the end of Zwingli's ministry just to give you a, a flavour of the political situation. It was Charles the fifth who was the emperor of of the time uh, near the end of Swingley's uh, career um, the theology of Swingley uh, just some important things to remember 
is that uh, his hermeneutic of understanding scripture. For him, scripture was sole authority. That was the main thing. And scripture uh, was interpreted in its historical context. And that was uh, the revolutionary aspect of Zwingli's thinking. Um, the other theology is, is the Eucharist, that it was only symbolic, the blood of Christ and the bread of, that we take was only a symbol of who Christ was. <coughs> he was a humanist scholar. Um, and so, so, sorry, that was his theology. Um, some of his legacy would be that he, he was a humanist scholar, learned uh, in those times. He had about 300 books, that, and the books... Um, within his library were a mixture of humanist, uh, patristic, um, Luther the reformers. There's been a running debate over many many years whether Zwingli was his own man the as a theologian or whether he borrowed from Luther. When Zwingli died, he died in a battle, killed in a battle. Um, he got political and helped to raise an army. Um, Bullinger Bullinger uh, became his successor and consolidated Zwingli's uh, Reformation. Now, there's a lot of complexity uh, because the Swiss cantons uh, were sort of independent of the empire of the time, um, of the sort of Holy Roman Empire or whatever whatever you, uh, it was called. But there, there was the uh, empire that uh, they would have an emperor and the Swiss cantons, they were sort of independent. And there was other independent cantons as well. There was there was in Milan, there was a, a state there that was free. And so when the Reformation was taking place, there was a lot of political issues going around. It was very, very complex in Switzerland. And Zwingli got, got immersed in that. It was a place known for mercenaries and, and um, etc. So... So that's just a, a few facts about Zwingli. So what do we make of Zwingli? Uh, I think that if you get a chance, try and find out research about Zwingli's method of interpretation. I think that sounds really interesting. And uh, I, I, I think that that would be a fruitful um, place to begin to read Zwingli and, and do some research on him. Zwingli was also a man who loved music. Uh, he could play several instruments. He could play uh, the flute. He could play um, the violin. He could play the horn. It was extremely musical. Uh, he said that he was against music totally in the church, but recent scholars have said no. He was against. He was against Gregorian chants and and sort of the Latin aspects of worship that were brought in by the Catholics. He was against that, but he weren't against congregational singing. That's what some scholars have recently said. But whether that's the case, he was a man interested in music uh, and very gifted, and that would be an area to look into. What what uh, what other instruments did he play? He played several instruments, and what else did he say about music? That would be an interesting field to research. <laughs> His doctrine of the Eucharist, uh, I agree with, uh, is something... Uh, that you could look into. Um, the strengths and the weaknesses of Wingley, I think the strengths, he was absolutely determined to be scriptural and to call the church back to scripture. The weaknesses, he did get so political and wrapped up in the politics of the time, but who can blame him? Because, I mean, it was a very difficult situation uh, that he was in. Uh, the Swiss cantons would have been under serious threat by uh, Catholic uh, soldiers, Catholic nations. Uh, so what would you do in that situation? It would be very difficult uh, to to know what to do. And so we can be critical of Swingley. But to be honest, um, I think we might be too hard in our criticism of him. What I get out of Swingley is a man who... I just love the fact that he stayed in the city and looked after the, the people who were people of the pla who, who were affected by the plague. I love that, and that's what a true pastor is. 
someone who, who's willing to give their lives down for the sheep. I also love the fact that he was a man of scripture, that he wanted to get back to the scriptures. And that he was just absolutely dedicated to bringing the church back to the scriptures. And I think that if we truly call the church back to the scriptures, then we will, in the end, there will be conflict within the church. And I think sometimes there has to be a price to be paid. There is a price to be paid to call in the church back to scripture. And that price is it will bring conflict within the church. But within that conflict will come a new understanding and a, a deeper understanding of who God is and a deeper understanding of the Word of God and a new understanding of how to apply the Word of God. So even though it seemed like everything was just being thrown up in the air during the Reformation and in, and in the Swiss cantons and with uh, in Zurich with Zwingli, everything just seemed to be thrown in the air. It seemed to be chaotic that what these reformers were doing, just changing the old order. In the end, it was a good thing because it, it got the church thinking again what was in the Bible. And also, it was good because the Catholic Church had become so powerful and so controlling that it needed to be challenged. And, you know, sometimes, every, every now and again in history, every 100 or 200 years, there needs to be that challenge to the hierarchy of the church in the sense that the church hierarchy can become domineering can become controlling and, and lose the plot of what it's all about. It's all about teaching people the word of God and loving people. But the church can become very, very domineering and controlling. And every now and again, God raises up people to upset the apple cart and challenge the existing order. He did it with Charles Wesley. He did it, uh, he did it, um, um, he did it in Germany with Onken, the German Spurgeon. He did it with the Aldane brothers in Scotland. Just every now and again, God raises up people who just shake the very foundations of the church to make them think, to get them back into the word of God. So that's Wingley for you. A few little facts. I'll try and put a few links for you and you can do your own research. All right. God bless you.